Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, as, as Dan read, uh, our Torah portion this week is Parashat Kedushim. And it begins with God telling Moses to speak to the congregation of Israel and say, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And I'd like to speak to you today on holiness. Now, I'm not the first one recently to speak on this topic. Uh, Back in February, Travis Snow stood up here and spoke on holiness and mission, looking at 2 Corinthians 6 and 7. Three weeks ago, David spoke on holiness and the fear of the Lord. And two weeks ago, uh, Scott Robison stood here and spoke to us about holiness, about Isaiah 6, Isaiah's vision of the Lord, seated on his throne, high and exalted. And the seraphim calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And this is actually going to be the first of several messages I'm going to be giving on holiness. I'll be speaking every month or two for the next few months on the topic. And I've been planning to speak on this since last fall. And I didn't know at the time we were going to have others speak on it. When Travis spoke on this, he didn't know I was planning to speak on it. When Scott was planning on what he was going to speak on, he didn't know that David and I were going to be speaking on it. I didn't know any of them were going to speak on it. David's the only one who knew what we were all speaking on, and yet he still wanted to speak on it. And so God has been putting on the hearts of our teachers at this congregation to bring messages on this topic. I think he has something that he wants us to learn. I think he wants to impress something on us. I think he wants to do a work here, and I think this is preparatory for that work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are high and exalted. You are kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. And Lord, those who come and see you, your majesty, tremble and they fall on their face. Lord, speak to us today. Speak through me. Your words, Lord. Speak to each of those who is here to hear what you want them to hear. May we be your holy people, fit for your holy purpose, Lord, to honor you as holy. Amen. Now, I'd like to talk today about what is holiness and why is it important. I want to talk about what is holiness because I think There's a lot of misunderstanding. I think a lot of times we confuse it with righteousness. And that's understandable because there is a lot of overlap between holiness and righteousness. Holiness often involves, but not always, often involves righteousness, but they're not the same thing. Righteousness has to do with doing what's right, about being honest in our words, in our business dealings, about being moral, about doing right by your fellow man, right words, right actions. Holiness, what is holiness? If you've been around for here for any length of time, you know that the Hebrew word kadosh means holy. It's an adjective. And what it means is it's it's describing something that's set apart or dedicated to a deity. And the vast majority that this of times in the scriptures that this word and other words derived from the same root occur, it's referring, the deity in reference, is the Lord himself. There are occasions where it is used in reference to a pagan deity. Okay, uh, There's a reference where the verb is used in reference to Baal Peor. Uh, King Jehu, he says, consecrate a fast for Baal. Uh, the Hebrew word Kedeshah refers to a shrine prostitute, a woman who has been dedicated to a pagan deity for her participation in certain aspects of the pagan worship. But 
we're going to talk about it in reference to the Lord, and that's how it's used the vast majority of the time. And when this adjective is used of God, he is kadosh, 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 it's referring uh, to his his apartness, his set apartness from the rest of his creation, his transcendency, his exalt, exalted and glorious state, like Isaiah saw in his vision. We also get from the same root, we get the word kodesh, which means apartness, sacredness. And uh, you're probably familiar hearing the term in Ruach HaKodesh, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we say, or the Spirit of Holiness. Uh, it also can refer to uh, something which uh, is holy as a noun. For example, uh, the tabernacle is called HaKodesh, the holy place, the holy thing. There's also, from the same root, we get a verb, Kadash. And as you can see right here, uh, it's the same three letters, <laughs> all words, because in Hebrew, words derive from roots, which are usually three letters, occasionally two, and then different words are formed from those roots by different patterns of vowels. If you can see well enough, uh, there are different vowel points on those words, and also by adding uh, suffixes and prefixes. And the verb in its simplest form in the call, it means simply to be or become holy. Because this root has to do with a state, uh, therefore the verb is simply to be or to become that state. To be or become set apart for a deity. And as such, we usually translate it as be holy or become holy. In other verb patterns, it has more of, of a sense of action. And in those patterns, it's usually translated as to consecrate, to sanctify, or simply to make holy. And one meaning is to dedicate or cause to be set apart for a deity. It's the action of taking something and making it holy. Okay, And we see a good example of this in Exodus 29.44. I will consecrate the Kadash, the Kadash T, the tent of meeting, and the altar. Aaron also and his sons, I will consecrate a Kadesh to serve me as priests. He is setting apart Aaron and his sons as priests. He's setting apart the tent and the altar for special purposes. Okay? Before this, Aaron was Aaron, the brother of Moses. Now he's going, he and his sons will be priests before the Lord because God is dedicating them, setting them apart for that purpose. So it can mean to dedicate or cause to be set apart for a deity. It can also mean to treat or honor as holy. And a good example of this is in Leviticus 10, verse 1. Now Nadav and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and, authorized unauthor and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord says, Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, Ekadesh, and before all the people, I will be glorified. Now, those who are near God do not make God holy. We don't dedicate him. He is holy. We do not glorify him. That is, we don't make him glorious. He is glorious. He is who he is. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So here, he is not saying that those who are near him are going to make him holy, he's saying that they will honor him and treat him as holy, which Nadab and Avihu did not. So it can mean to treat or honor as holy. 
A third thing, it, another thing it can mean is to purify or prepare a thing for a holy purpose. In 1 Chronicles 15, 12, this is just one of example, David is speaking to the priests and to the heads of the Levites. He says, you are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, he cut a shoe, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of of Israel to the place that I have prepared for it. Now, the Levites and the priests had already been set apart for the purpose of service to the tabernacle and, in, and for the priests, the carrying of the ark back in the time of Moses. So he's not, David is not saying, set yourselves apart and we're going to appoint you to do this job. He's saying, prepare yourselves, purify yourselves, and cleanse yourselves so that you are ready to do the job that you have already been set apart for. So it can mean to purify or prepare a thing for a holy purpose. Now, I want to give you a little illustration here that I think will help uh, illustrate some of the differences. Uh, many of you here are married, and you have... A wedding ring. And that ring was given to you by your husband or your wife as a pledge in your marriage. And there may be many other rings out there that look like it. You might be able to go to a store and say, hey, that was, that's my ring. But that one there is not your ring. The one on your finger is your ring. And the one in the case doesn't have the same significance to you as the one on your finger. Because that one that's on your finger has been dedicated to you. It's been set apart from all the others as the ring your husband or your, your, your groom or your bride gave you on your wedding day. Now, imagine with me that your ring was a little loose and you discovered it had slipped off your finger. You'd start looking around for it, and if you found it on the carpet, you'd probably pick it up and put it right back on your finger. But suppose you were out in the backyard and as you're hunting around looking for it, you finally find it. It's in a pile of dog poop. You're not going to grab that ring and just shove it right back on your finger. It is not fit to be on your finger. It should be on your finger, but not the way it is right then. You're going to take it. You're going you're gonna to get like a paper towel or a tissue or a plastic bag or a disposable glove or something to pull it out. You're going to hose it off or take it inside and wash it. You may... Uh, you may disinfect it, and only when it's be you've cleaned it up and it's no longer contaminated are you going to put it back on your finger. Only then is it fit to return to its proper place. It, when you see it there in the pile, you don't say, ooh, well, scratch that ring, we'll need to get another one. It's your wedding ring. You fetch it out of there and you clean it off because it is special to you. It does not cease being your wedding ring just because it got contaminated. But because it's your wedding ring, you're going to clean it up. And it's the same with holy things. If a priest becomes unclean, becomes contaminated, he is not to enter the tabernacle or the temple. He is not to approach the altar. He is not to eat any of the holy offerings while he's unclean. Once he has been cleansed and purified, he can return to his place and duties. He can return to participating in the holy things that God has appointed him to participate in and do and to perform. So we've talked some about what is holiness, what does it mean. Let's look at a few different aspects of holiness. What kinds of things are holy? We're going to go through these quickly. Time can be holy. Okay, the first use of the root of this word is in Genesis 2-3, where God, having made the earth in six days, he rested on the seventh, he blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy. Time can be holy. The year of Jubilee is also called holy. Physical items can be holy. The tabernacle and all its furnishings, priestly garments, anointing oil, incense, these things are all called holy. The tithe is called holy. 
places can be holy. We've just read about Moses and the burning bush, and God says to him, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The priests are to eat the portion of the offering that's theirs in a holy place. Jerusalem is the holy city. Zion, the holy mountain. The land of Israel is called holy. Ezekiel, in his vision of the future ta temple, uh, he says there's going to be a district around Jerusalem that will be holy. Now, I want you to notice that these three things here are not people and they're not actions. They are not things that have moral quality. They aren't righteous or wicked. So holiness is not the same as righteousness, and sometimes it doesn't involve it. But now we get on to things that are moral. People. People can be holy. The priest is holy. Israel is called holy. The Nazarites, the firstborn. Paul refers to the holy apostles and prophets. Parts of the body can be holy. The head of the Nazarite is holy. Paul talks about lifting up holy hands. Also, assemblies where people come together can be holy. He says on, on Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the first day and the last day, do no work, have a sacred assembly. In our home, we gathered, we had our Seder in honor of God. That's why we were gathered for Him. And on the last day, at the end of the day, we got together, we spent some time to pray, to sing, and to eat, to finish off the Feast of Matzot with a little more matzo, matzah. Today, we're gathered here not for business, not for entertainment, not for sports. We're gathered here in honor of God. This is a holy assembly. Actions can be holy. Joe call, Joel calls the people to have a holy fast. Paul, in several of his letters, ends by saying, greet one another with a holy kiss. The scriptures are called holy. Paul talks about the law and the commandment as being holy, righteous, and good. Daniel refers to the holy covenant. Angels are called holy. God's name is holy. And God himself is holy. There are different degrees of holiness, too. We see that God has called all Israel to be holy, and yet he's chosen them, set them apart from the other nations. Yet, the Levites, he set apart from the rest of Israel for service at his tabernacle. Among the Levites, he chose Aaron and his sons as priests to serve in the tabernacle and to, to attend to the altar. And among all the priests, one is chosen as the high priest, the only one who is set apart for going into the most holy place once a year. There are also different orders of holiness. Obviously, priests are holy because of their relationship uh, to the tabernacle, their service there. But Nazarites are also holy, and they're holy in a somewhat different way. And there are different rules that apply to priests and Nazarites. The Nazarite takes a vow of separation. Uh, Nazarite comes from the Hebrew word nazir, set to separate. The, he takes a vow of separation at the beginning, or she, at the beginning of the vow, shaves off all the hair of the head. During the vow, keeps himself separate from wine, alcoholic beverages, uh, fruit of the vine, d the dead, and other things. At the end of the vow, however long he vowed to his vow to be, he's going to go, he's going to make an offering at the temple. His hair is going to be shaved off, and his hair is going to be put on the altar of burnt offering and burnt up. So he is growing out on his head an offering to God. Gives a new thought to uh, a living offering. And they're different in, there are different rules that apply to priests and Nazarites because their dedication is in a different way. 
briefly, how do things become holy? Usually by being dedicated. Things can be dedicated by people. Uh, Leviticus 27 talks about many different things that can be given to God as part of a vow, an animal offering, a house, a field, all of which are called holy. Okay, In Numbers 5, anything donated to God and given to a priest is holy. Korah and his followers, you know, they, they were rebelling against Moses uh, and Aaron challenging their God-given authority. They came in rebellion and sin. God opened up the earth and swallowed Korah and his household, and then fire came out and burned up Korah's followers. And then God says, go grab the, the censers that they had incense in, because they are holy. They were dedicated to the Lord. And so those censers are gathered up. Even though the men were in sin and what they were doing, they brought these, these censers to the Lord, and they were holy, therefore. Samuel was dedicated by his mother to God. Things can also be dedicated to the Lord by the Lord himself. The Sabbath, he made holy. The tent of meeting and the priests, we read about that, he made them holy. Israel, he has set apart. And as another example, Samson, an individual whom he set apart before he was even conceived. Things can also become holy by touching certain holy things, which are referred to as most holy. The altar burnt offering is most holy. Whatever touches it becomes holy. So are all the articles of the tabernacle. Whatever touches them becomes holy. The grain offering after the memorial portion has been burned on the altar is for the priest to eat, and it's called most holy, and anything that touches it becomes holy. Likewise with the flesh of the sin offering. Things can also become holy when they're anointed with the anointing oil. So, we've seen, we've talked about what holiness is. We've looked at some different aspects of holiness. Why is holiness important? Why is it important to us? I want you to see that holiness has to do with relationship to God. Obviously, things that are holy have been dedicated to him. But when it comes to people, which is our emphasis here, we are holy because we have special and privileged relationship with him. He said, we read at the beginning, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It's imperative that we are holy because we are near him and he is holy. We celebrated Passover. Why did God bring the people out of Egypt? He brought them out of Egypt through the Red Sea, across the desert, as Dan was talking about, back to the mountain where God had met Moses. We read in Exodus 19, verse 16, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. The people were terrified. God spoke to them the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. They said, don't let him speak to us anymore. We'll die. Moses, you go talk to him, and you come back and tell us what he says. So Moses goes up to the mountain. And while he's up there, God gives him instructions on building the tabernacle and all its furnishings. And we read in Exodus 29, he spe God speaking of the tabernacle says, There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it will be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. They will know that I brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. God had come down from heaven to the top of the mountain. He didn't want to stay there. He wanted to come down from the mountain and be among the people and dwell among them. God 
wants to dwell among us. He did it again. Yeshua came down from heaven to dwell among us. And well, now he has returned to the Father, he has sent in his place the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And Yeshua is going to return again to live with us. The new Jerusalem is going to come down out of heaven to the earth and the dwelling place of God will be with man. God desires to dwell with us. He desires to make his home with us. He desires to have communion with us. When a child is adopted, he's brought into a family. He takes on the name of the family. He comes into their home and he has to live according to the family's rules and the rules of the home. If we are going to dwell with God, we must be holy because He is holy. And being near God is a fabulous thing. In Exodus 19, when God is offering the people the covenant, He says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to Myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And years later, Moses is reflecting in Deuteronomy. He says, for what nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is near us whenever we call upon Him. Being near God and having relationship with Him is a wonderful thing. And yet it comes with responsibility. Leviticus 15.31 Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. We must not defile God's home. And yet what we have is so much better than what ancient Israel had because God has now made a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And we, through the blood of Messiah, get to be part of that. Jew or Gentile, we enter through his blood. They were sprinkled with the blood of animals, he took the cup after dinner and he said, this is the cup of my blood. Drank this in remembrance of me. His blood symbolically goes in us and it cleanses us, not just on the outside, but all the way through that we might be holy. We have been consecrated and set apart by better blood in a better way for greater glory and intimacy. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 and on, we read, What agreement is there between the temple of God with idols? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. In Asia, it has long been uh, customary that people sit on the floors of their houses, they sleep on the floors of their houses, and so they keep their floors much cleaner than we generally do. When you go, when they come into their house, they take off their shoes and go into the house so that they don't track dirt and mud and any other thing that might have gotten stepped in into the house. If you know somebody who's Asian, and I don't mean Asian descent, I mean from Asia, you go to their house, you take off their, your shoes when you go to their house. And if you don't, you're being rude and thoughtless, and you're basically saying, I don't care if you sleep in my dirt. We must not defile God's sanctuary. We must not track dirt into his home. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you, 
and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. He wants us. Can you imagine the God of the whole universe? says he wants us to be his sons and daughters. Not just his servants. He wants us to be his family. Paul says, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. We must cleanse ourselves of the things that defile us. We have been set apart for him. When we become contaminated, we are not in a condition which is in keeping with our holy position. We must cleanse our bodies and our spirits from that which contaminates us so that we are in a state that is fitting for our holy purpose, our holy calling, our holy communion with Him. Holiness is important because it has to do with relationship with God. And we have intimate relationship with Him. He calls us His sons and His daughters. He calls us His bride. Paul says that a man's body is not his own, it belongs to his wife, and a woman's body is not her own, it belongs to her husband. We are his bride. Our bodies do not belong to us, they belong to him. We must keep those bodies pure and spotless, fit for him, not defiled, not compromised, not mingled with things with other things. That is, a woman must be faithful to her husband and he to his wife. We must be faithful to him. And when, because we have intimate relationship with him, a wonderful thing, we just sang, you know, I want to sit at your feet. I want to take the cup from your hand. I want to lay back against you and breathe. This is the intimacy of family. This is the kind of intimacy he desires with us. But we must not go tracking dog poop into his house. What do you put in front of your eyes? What do you listen to? These things that go in, are they fit for God's holy temple? What do you consume with your mouth? and what comes out of your mouth showing what is inside. Are you purifying yourselves from everything that contaminates? And a child, takes on, a child that's adopted takes on the name of his family, his adopted family. A woman, when she marries, she takes on her husband's name. We have taken on the name of God Amen. because we are his. In Leviticus 22, verse 31, he says, So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord, and you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. His holy name is not only the tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Heh, his name that we don't normally say, but in Hebrew, name also refers to reputation. We are not to profane his reputation. We bear his name. We are not to drag it through the dirt. How do your actions, how do your words reflect on God's reputation. Do people see you and say, he is holy, he is set apart, or are you a lot like them? Among the people who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. We must 
consecrate ourselves, not making ourselves holy, for he has already done that. We must prepare ourselves, cleanse ourselves, so that we are fit for our holy place. Theologians talk about the process of sanctification. And it's, they say, the lifelong process by which we are becoming, becoming what? Becoming holy? If we view sanctification as the process by which I slowly, over the long course of my life, become a little more and more holy, slowly, well, one, I think we have a pretty high view of our own actions, and two, we have a very low view of our own holiness because we don't see that we've arrived, we don't see that we're very holy yet, and we probably don't act that way. We are far more holy than Aaron. Not in the same way, but in a better way. We, therefore, must live that way. We must treat what is holy as holy. That's we must honor him as holy because he is holy and his name as holy That's and his body. We are the body of Messiah. We must honor his body as holy. At the Last Supper, Yeshua went around washing the disciples' feet. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Yeshua answered, If I do not wash you, you shall have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Yeshua said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. God has set us apart as holy. He has made us holy. But we, as we walk through this world, we become defiled, we step in dirt, mud, and worse. We don't, when we come to holy ground, we want to take off our shoes. We don't want to track dirt into his house. We must purify ourselves and act as the holy people that we are. Yes. Sanctification is the process by which we learn to conform our lives to the fact of our holiness of what he has done in setting us apart for him. I think God wants to do through our congregation much more than he has yet. And I think he wants to prepare us for the work he's going to do. And part of that is as we renew and rededicate ourselves to him in holiness. Holiness in terms of righteousness and what we do, but holiness in other ways as, as he teaches us in the scripture. So today, as I've been speaking, if the Lord has been putting it on your heart, if he's been convicting you of things in which you have not been living as in the way which is fitting for your holy position, take time now to confess that to him and to choose to consecrate yourself and live in a way which is honoring him. Live in a way which is fitting for your calling and your position, which is in keeping with the service and the work he wants to do in you and through you. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, you are high and exalted and lifted up. You are magnified and glorious. What is man that you should be mindful of him? Oh, Lord, you want to come and be among us. You have come, and you are among us. And yet, like Isaiah, woe to us, for we are a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. And yet the angel took the coal and touched it to his lips and said, See, your sin has been atoned for. And Yeshua has atoned for our sin and cleansed us that we might have that relationship with you. And yet, we must bring, we must cleanse ourselves from all that defiles our body and our spirit, Lord. 
Lord, help us to cleanse ourselves and walk in holiness in keeping with what Yeshua has done. May we be fit temples for you. Teach us, Lord, and impress upon us all that you want us to be and the condition you want us to be in, that we might seek you wholly, fully, Lord, giving you our bodies, giving you our hearts, giving you our affections, yes, yes. giving you our lives as we live with you and as your life, the life of Yeshua's blood, the life is in the blood, has gone into us. Now it is no longer I who live, but Yeshua who lives in me. Lord, may we as we live, live holy lives as, and be holy as you are holy. Yes. That we might commune fully with you, that there would be no thing that stands between us, Lord. <clears throat> we ask this in the mighty name that is above all names, the name that is high and exalted, the name of Yeshua. Amen. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E I T Z dash C H A I M dot org. Or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.